welcome. My name is Janita Bacalaza. I'm an activist from Bolivia, and I also work at the Human Rights Foundation. It's an honor for us to hold this panel in partnership with the city of Oslo as part of our program called Defending the Defenders. Through this program, HRF is able to support the work of brave environmental activists across the world who are facing up to authoritarian regimes in order to protect the world's flora and fauna. Defending the Defenders was first launched in 2019 at the Oslo Freedom Forum, the global human rights event that the Human Rights Foundation holds annually in Oslo, Norway. We are excited to bring this conversation to RightsCon because the killing of indigenous leaders and environmental activists across the world in order to cover up environmental crimes and silence whistleblowers is very commonplace at this point in history and something must be done in order to stop this. Personally, as a young Bolivian activist, I've experienced the risk of working for defending the environment in authoritarian regimes. Last year, when Bolivia faced an environmental crisis, many of us activists were heavily persecuted by the Bolivian government because we dared to speak up in defense of our forest. The Bolivian government had just legalized the use of fires in forest areas in order to expand agricultural territory, since my government had made a deal with the Chinese government that we were going to be exporting high amounts of beef in the quantity that Bolivia had never produced before. As a result, over 5 million hectares of forest were lost, as well as the lives of many firemen. This is why we must understand that human rights and environmental issues are not separate issues, and they are both meant to be protected by the international community. Today, to lead the, this discussion, we have Melissa Matani, who is a member of the, of the Oslo Freedom Forum. She's a wonderful journalist and a social TV producer for CNN. And she will be leading us today as we speak to brave environmental activists who are currently protecting the humanity's most important source of life, Mother Earth herself. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much, Janice. It really is a pleasure for me to be a part of this really important conversation. Environmental activists, environmental journalists, and the work they do is more important than ever. And unfortunately, we are seeing less of it because it's increasingly dangerous as authoritarian governments feel more emboldened around the world. It was dangerous before the coronavirus pandemic hit and in many cases is even more dangerous now. We're going to have a really interesting conversation about the intersection of digital rights and climate activism shortly. But first, I want to introduce you to Mark Oner. He's a Goldman Prize winner and he is the founder of the environmental NGO Brain Forest. He led efforts to publicly expose the illegal agreements behind a huge mining product project in his country. And uh, he joins us now for a keynote speech. Mark? Ladies and gentlemen, it's with uh, great pleasure for me to speak today on this occasion. I'm proud to be a member of the Oslo Freedom Forum community, which connect me to a vast network of followers, activists, technologists, and journalists. It was part of the first Defending the Defenders panel discussion at the Oslo Freedom Forum in 2019. And I am happy to see that our community of environmental activists is expanding. I have absolutely resolutely engaged in environmental activist, activism for a very simple reason. Almost 90% of my country, Gabon, is covered with forest. Protecting and sustainably managing this rich natural treasure should be the responsibility of our government. But we don't have democracy or the role of law in Gabon. For nearly 60 years, Gabon has been ruled by a single family from father to son. Those who criticize the government are arrested or thrown in jail. The internet and social media services are sometimes censored, protecting the environment by taking a stand against this authoritarian regime is difficult and dangerous. For example, I myself was put in prison for taking a stand with my 
NGO Brain Forest, again, mining project for one of the largest iron deposits in Africa. A Chinese company, in partnership with the government of my country, initiated the project with promises of economic growth and the creation of 3,000 jobs. However, this project endangered a natural reserve, which includes Congo and Mingoli Falls. These falls are classified among the most beautiful in Central Africa. For taking a stand against this project, I was subjected to a lot of harassment. The police read my, my NGO's office. I was accused of waiting to overthrow the government and sabotaging the development of my country. The government came after my family. To combat illegal logging in other environmental crimes, my organization Brain Forest Gabon does independent forest monitoring. Before the occurrence of COVID-19 in March, we did this monitoring through both fields, visit and communicating with people in the forest, despite the poor state of roads and the digital gaps between the capital and the countryside. Since the lockdown restriction imposed by government, the internet and digital tools have become essential for us to continue our activities. We are gradually adapting to the new situation with the help of our partners, such as the Environmental Investigation Agency, which is training us to use innovative digital tools to call rich time information on illegal activities in the forest. This type of partnership is crucial for us in this period, especially because it integrates the classic elements of our way of working with the innovative system and will also allow a better flow in information. In order to continue defending the environment, we need our support to defend our digital rights and access to a free and open internet. We also need technology partnership to use innovative digital tools to expose environmental crimes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you for the tireless work that you continue to do. So we're very lucky to uh, be joined today by activists from all different regions of the world who I hope are going to be joining us now. We have Evgenia Chirikova. She is also a Goldman Prize winner. Uh, let's see if hopefully she can come up on your screens. She is uh, originally from Russia, but she's now living in exile in Estonia. I'm told that she's not with us yet, but hopefully she will be with us in a moment. I do know that we have Peter Schwartzstein with us. He's an environmental journalist and non-resident fellow at the Center for Climate Security. He has worked extensively in the Middle East with a deep focus on water security, which is, uh, there he is, <laughs> a very important topic facing the world right now. And he recently spoke to dozens of activists for a piece he wrote about the authoritarian war on environmental journalism, a very, very timely article. Um, I will let you know when we are going to be joined by hopefully Evgenia and also Ariel Ruiz Serquiola, who's a Cuban biologist who might be joining us. But for the moment, Peter, since I have you, um, I want to talk to you a little bit just about coronavirus. I was saying before that the work that journalists do is so important and increasingly dangerous. It was hard to do before the pandemic in terms of getting access to sites, actually trying to get access to data to find out what the government is doing. And in many cases, that's 10,000 times harder. With all of your experience in the Middle East, what's been your experience during this pandemic? Uh, Peter, just hang on a second. We can't hear you. 
Sorry. All right, I'm back now. Um, You're back. Thank you very much Wonderful. for having me. <laughs> um, uh, no, I mean, as um, uh, kind of much of the world has, of course, found in, in the last few months, COVID has uh, turned everything upside down. And environmental journalism is uh, unfortunately very far from an exception. Uh, on a, a purely practical level, um, kind of an inability for, for journalists, and particularly environmental journalists, to actually access many of the places that we're writing about has been an absolute nightmare. And this is not just a, a kind of a problem for those who, who sort of fly around the place, um, such as the severity of many of the lockdowns that have been implemented over the course of the last few months, that even journalists based in capitals or regional centers across the Middle East and North and East Africa have been unable to kind of reach many of these often isolated, distant um, uh, areas in which a lot of the worst abuses are, are taking place. So on, a, on that kind of logistical um, basis, this has been uh, a, an absolute nightmare. Uh, and on a, on a practical uh, kind of a, perhaps a, a, a sort of more um, a sort of journalistic level, uh, the very fact that the pandemic has just come to completely consume uh, the world and by extension journalism over the last five months has sort of pushed climate change and other environmental problems off the front pages at a point when it kind of, for those of us in the in the kind of environmental journalism community, uh, it really felt like we were beginning to establish some real momentum. Um, it's not that there's ever a, a good time for a, for a global pandemic, but this was a particularly bad one. And, and then just one, one final little point. I mean, uh, the, the nature of, of kind of many of the worst environmental abuses um, is such that kind of a, a pandemic style um, lockdown is an absolute boon uh, for kind of a lot of these um, sort of repressive government and uh, irresponsible uh, corporate folks who are presiding over a, a lot of the worst um, uh, damage. Um, so again, for, for journalism and media and, and uh, conservationism at large, this has been a, a disaster. Uh, but for those of us on, on, on this beat in particular, it's, it's uh, been extremely difficult to work around. And, you know, what you were just saying is, is, is so interesting. I also feel like there was a moving momentum in terms of climate journalism. We saw last year, for example, there were the global climate strikes. This year, before the pandemic hit, the rise of Greta Thunberg, which was getting lots of young people interested. And it just felt that even online, there was just this momentum behind, uh, the, behind the climate and people's awareness. And I feel that that has completely waned, partly because people are so concerned about other things, you know, their health. Obviously, sometimes, especially in some of the poorer countries, people just struggling to make ends meet. Um, so the climate has shifted. But you know, we have to be quite honest, this is also a, a very uh, strategic attack by authoritarian governments to get the climate out of the limelight. Would you agree? I, I certainly would. And I mean, unfortunately, as we've seen in the last few months, it's not just purely sort of recognizable authoritarian governments. Um, the, the Trump administration, Bolsonaro's Brazil and an array of other countries that we wouldn't necessarily automatically associate with authoritarianism also appear to have sort of taken advantage of uh, the kind of all-encompassing distraction that is the pandemic to kind of loosen uh, environmental regulations, to force through um, various um, measures that in the US's case have impeded uh, folks looking to um, uh, protest uh, against um, fossil fuel pipelines. Um, so this, is, this has been um, exceedingly difficult. And it's just a, a kind of... Um, an extension of uh, kind of a, a, a problem that, that environmentalists and, and kind of everybody throughout the kind of environment related world has has been dealing with in recent years. There's the idea that the, the sort of development and, and sort of growth and environmental protection are kind of um, sort of almost opposing forces. And so if one has a, a country in which there's like a particular clamor for, um, for new jobs in which authorities are uh, often extremely fearful of the possibility of kind of un or underemployed youth. Um, those are the instances in which states and governments and, and regimes often kind of go out of their way to kind of crush um, those who might look to defend the environment. So, so what the pandemic has done in crushing 
kind of economic growth to an even greater extent than we've seen previously um, is, is most likely to kind of fuel uh, an even kind of more accelerated government bid to, to kickstart economies once, once, uh, once the, 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 the disease has, has waned somewhat. And, you know, so we have seen also, I, I suppose, that one of the, the trying to be positive here, with everybody stuck at home, you are seeing more people search out, uh, you know, articles on the internet or trying to to look, I mean, it's, it's kind of one of the things that you said, obviously, people are looking for jobs and people are looking for food. But then on the other hand, they have actually seen like what can happen to the to nature around them, you know, when you're inside, you're longing to be outside and you're kind of appreciating those things more. Um, have you seen like a difference in 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 how the climate is perceived in some of the different countries that you've worked in? Because you've written extensively about like Egypt, for example, and North Africa, but equally, you know, your work extends to other areas in the world. Have you seen any similarities or differences that you would point out through regions or specific countries in the way that they handle this? One of the things that's most um, perhaps arresting about um, talking to, to sort of farmers and fishermen and sort of regular urbanites um, throughout much of kind of North and East Africa and, and the Middle East, my kind of usual areas of work and, and occasionally further afield, is that you don't get people um, sort of Republican Party style climate change denialists. Like the, the fact that something is going horribly wrong with uh, the climate and with the environment at large is, is rather kind of blatantly obvious to, to everyone, even if they can't necessarily articulate the concept of climate change in 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 the terms that, that scientists might um so that's a, a kind of a really quite um i guess in your face illustration of how uh, fast and how dramatically things are, are changing um i'll give you an example in in parts of, of sudan kind of various villages that i've been visiting um on and off uh, kind of over the past three or four years the, the desert Sahara sands are advancing at, at a speed of up to a few hundred meters a year. Um, so when you already have this kind of very thin little belt of greenery either side of the Nile, and it's getting kind of eaten away at at a pretty fearsome pace by the desert, um, you are in no way going to be sort of denying that something is, is horribly amiss. The, the problem, of course, is that many of these people lack political agency to make their, their concerns heard. Um, and in many countries in which uh, governments are, are up against a, a sort of fearsome array of, of, of conflicts and financial crises, um, often, sort of understandably to a certain extent, these things get kind of buried uh, amid other concerns. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there's one of the, the consistent threads, however, is that kind of fairly broad um, perception that, that, that global environmental conditions are, are spiraling out of control. You know, it's it's so ironic because it's like when you talk about it in those terms and it's it's literally like, it's almost a matter of life and death in some countries, you know, or, or national security, depending on where you're talking about, whether it's Sudan or whether it's food security or whether it's water security. It just seems to me that these leaders would benefit so much from trying to actually protect their country's biodiversity, protect their country's natural resources. And in some ways it would be a hero to their own people. And the fact that they are so eager to kind of crush these movements or crush the information in the people who are trying to get this information out, is just, you know, crazy. I mean, let's just take a step back and assess why they're so reluctant to act and, and why they're, they're so eager to crush these movements. Do you think it is money uh, do you think it's power, or do you think it is a mixture of both? Well, yeah, I mean, you've hit on, on what is perhaps the single most frustrating thing about the entire crackdown on, on the conservation movement globally, which is that it, it doesn't really make sense. Like, the environment ought to be an issue that kind of cuts across ideology, that cuts across all sorts of other, other um, political cleavages. It ought to be an area where kind of otherwise controversial politicians ought to be able to... Um, really set themselves apart. But I mean, the very fact that we're here is, a, is a, an illustration of, of, um, of a different reality. As to why that happens, well, of course, it, it, it differs somewhat from, from region to region to country to country. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's a kind of potent combination of, <clears throat> of money, of power, 
um, and of horribly misplaced priorities. From a, a financial perspective, even though inordinate, kind of inordinately large numbers of people, generally majorities throughout a lot of the kind of hardest hit countries in, in Africa and South Asia and Southeast Asia and Latin America, realize that things are going wrong, many of those are the kind of real centers of power have either vested financial interests with a lot of the kind of deeply polluting industries like fossil fuels or mining or logging or agribusiness. Uh, and as a consequence, they're among that kind of narrow minority that often do have a, a serious financial interest in maintaining this sort of polluting um, fossil fuel burning um, status quo. Uh, and then there's, the, yeah, there's the, the power element, which is that a lot of kind of authoritarian governments are deeply distrustful of, of the idea of citizens kind of coalescing around a particular issue, no matter what that issue is. Um, and so as, I mean, for, for most of the last few decades, with, with plenty of exceptions here or there, the environmental movement in the Middle East and, and North and East Africa was seen as, as, I mean, like a bunch of harmless tree huggers. And as a consequence, they largely escaped um, a, a lot of the, the kind of worst treatment dished out to other forms of, of civil society activists. But as the environment has been kind of deteriorating at this kind of ever more rapid speed, as climate change is just hitting home harder and harder, um, a lot of these governments, like those of, of Iran and Egypt and elsewhere, have kind of slowly woken to the fact that, well, these supposedly harmless tree huggers, from their perspective, are actually sort of messengers or sort of emissaries of a potentially destabilizing political force. Um, and so it's the kind of oldest trick in the book, they, they shoot the messengers. Um, and then the final, the final thing is that, I mean, as unfortunately we know, um, and this is true not just of, 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 of countries throughout um, a lot of the developing world, but, but in, in Europe and East Asia and in the US as well, a lot of politicians um, just seem by, by nature perhaps of their age or by nature of, of just being slightly blinkered folks, um, unaware of the extent of the environmental damage out there. Um, one of the problems, of course, on a global level is that a, a lot of um, uh, the real kind of power brokers, whether they be in media or finance or in politics, uh, are in cities that are often spared some of the worst um, kinds of, of environmental damage, um, as opposed to the, the sorts of issues that farmers and fishermen in more rural areas experience. Um, so in some instances, um, there's just a, a pure ignorance on the part of, of those in power, um, as, as jarring and, and uh, unlikely as that might sound. You know, it was interesting because you, you, you just gave a great example of how in some of the countries that you cover, there aren't climate deniers like you're seeing here in the GOP party, but um, because the evidence is just there for all to see. But in, in, but you still see this rise of uh, fake news that's just meant to weaken these people who are, as you said, a destabilizing force to the people in power. Now, in, in certain countries that you cover, you know, these mobile networks aren't that strong. I, I don't think in Sudan, for example, they have... Uh, it's not like every single person has a phone like they probably do in Egypt or in Dubai, for example. But are you still seeing the spread of fake fake news there as as big of a threat as it is in some countries like it is here in the US, for example? I mean, in general, yes. Um, within the, the sort of environmental sphere, it's it's harder to say. I mean, as, as concerned as... Uh, so much of the public is about kind of deteriorating urban air quality or, or kind of um, uh, extreme new kind of summer highs in, in rural areas. When you have so many other issues in front of you, um, kind of environment understandably perhaps hasn't yet assumed quite the sort of rhetorical importance that it ought to. So as a consequence of that sort of diminished rhetorical significance, um, it's not yet as polarizing a topic as it may very well soon be, and, and in a way that it sort of is in, in other parts of the world. However, one of the, the very interesting ways in which I'd say fake news within the kind of environmental sphere is beginning to kind of seep into um, to the discourse is, well, because kind of so much of the developing world, particularly Africa, has contributed um, uh, to such a meager extent to, to climate change. This is, as we know, a predominantly kind of Western and East Asian uh, phenomenon um, or, 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 or responsibility, um, because 
most of these countries in, in Africa, for example, have contributed such a meager share to global uh, carbon emissions. Um, there's sometimes a, a kind of temptation to use climate change, this kind of big global phenomenon that's beyond the, the control of local politicians as a kind of foil for their own failures. So in, I'll give you an example. In, in Nigeria, within a lot of the sort of conflict resolution community, there's a certain unease at the extent to which authorities are blaming climate change for violence in the country's northeast, with Boko Haram. We know it to be sort of part of the, of the um, equation. We know it to be one of the key reasons why um, uh, sort of farmer herder conflict and, and jihadism are, are, are continuing to spiral there. Um, but we, it's only one. Um, and it's uh, kind of been talked up to far too great an extent by government and by government affiliated media because it's a useful way of deflecting from their own failures and their own uh, kind of contributions to to that conflict. Um, so that's just a, a little a little snapshot as to how a different form of kind of climate related fake news can can play out. It's it's really interesting, and it's 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 really interesting just to hear about your knowledge and your experience in all of these different countries, which give us such different sort of. Uh, case scenarios of, 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 of how the climate is almost being weaponized. Um, what about Facebook? I mean, you know, we had Mark Zuckerberg here testifying on the Hill, and I'm just interested, is Facebook seen uh, as a spreader of fake news or as a tool for the environment in some of the countries where you are? I also apologize, that is just a doorbell. But this is what happens when you go online from home. <laughs> Yes, no, no, I'm, I'm waiting for all sorts of bangs and whistles in the background in my apartment. Um, again, it's, it's somewhat hard to say purely because the environment doesn't yet have the, the importance and by extension the sort of, I guess, power to polarize that, that perhaps it ought to. They're in a, um, from an environmental perspective, perhaps a, a few years away from, from climate change being the, um, the kind of lightning rod issue that, that unfortunately it so often is in, in Europe and America. And, and, and a number of other parts of the world. Um, however, because kind of climate and, and environmental activists within the Middle East are very slowly beginning to, to sort of mobilize in real numbers, and because Facebook uh, within the Middle East, for example, is extremely popular and like a prime means um, for mobilizing kind of large groups in, in uh, countries in which protest is often deterred, um, there are all sorts of kind of mutterings about kind of uh, government um, influence, security service infiltration of uh, environment civil society groups in places like Iraq. Um, there's an excellent uh, Baghdad-based um, uh, water campaigning group called Save the Tigris, which has done excellent work in trying to draw attention to the um, desperately uh, sad and, and depressing state of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Iraq. Um, and there have certainly been a number of instances in which uh, they believe, I think with good reason, uh, that some of their kind of Facebook organized events um, have been sort of sabotaged from within by, by security, um, Iraqi security affiliated folks. Um, so uh, kind of as things stand, I, I, I think social media hasn't yet, um, from, from an environmental perspective, become the perhaps negative force that, that, that it has um, in, in many other domains. But I fear that, that as sort of environmental issues um, continue to, to gain in, in um, sort of popular uh, interest, that, that that scenario might change. And so with the coronavirus pandemic, you know, it's only going to get worse in some of these countries in Africa, for example, in the Middle East, because whereas, I mean, they, uh, Africa especially is poorer and it's not as equipped with its health facilities to deal with this kind of outbreak. How do you think that's going to infect environmental journalism going forward? I mean, all of us are sort of flying by the seats of our pants at the moment, aren't we? Um, it's just extremely hard to sort of plan more than a, a few days in, in advance or even um, kind of have a, a decent sense as to, as to what the pandemic uh, kind of state in, in various countries will be even a, a, a week in, in advance. However, one of the unfortunate trends that, that I and many others within the kind of environmental journalism and, and wider environmental world fear 
is a kind of continuing crackdown on perhaps that the, the single most vulnerable bunch of, of environmental journalists and environmental activists. And that's those who, who actually operate in the most rural and the most distant parts of their countries. Uh, from an environmental journalism um, angle, uh, the, the single most um, victimized and harassed bunch of, of journalists are those who work for kind of small town newspapers or small town TV outlets or, or blogs uh, within kind of rural parts of India and Indonesia and Iran and places like that. Um, they lack the sort of protection of, of the kind of human rights community uh, at large that, that's often centered in uh, kind of capitals and, and other major urban centers. Um, they often, um, of course, live with, with their families at the mercy of, 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 of local bosses, of local um, political types, of, 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 of major and powerful corporations, many of which are, are kind of deeply in bed with those political players. Um, and so when the, the dust ultimately settles, once, when kind of we're, we're finally able to, to sort of come up for air and, and examine the, the kind of environmental fallout from COVID, uh, I and, and many others have a very big fear that that, that kind of particularly vulnerable subset of conservationists uh, might have been hit extra hard um, kind of in that, in that sort of relative news blackout and vacuum that, that's existed in a lot of these places over the last five months. So as an environmental journalist who has worked in all of these countries, what keeps you up at night? What is the biggest fear or the biggest challenge that you think is facing the climate right now? I mean, for, well, for, for a moment to be sort of, yeah, on a, on a macro level, to be sort of stunningly unoriginal, it's the, the, the speed at which um, uh, fossil fuels continue to be burnt and will almost certainly continue to be burnt uh, over the following years. I mean, I, I mentioned that, that brief example of, of villages in Sudan that are finding their kind of relatively scarce greenery um, disappearing at, at, at the most extraordinary speed. That's the kind of scenario that's just playing out um, in so many of, of, of the world's kind of hardest hit uh, landscapes, um, the sort of, particularly the, the sort of hot, uh, arid or semi-arid um, kind of middle latitudes. On, on a perhaps a, a more, slightly more manageable level, the, the sort of continuing and, and um, uh, intensely sort of problematic volumes of, of kind of water and air pollution in many of these places are, are kind of maximizing the impact of climate stress. Um, in, in Iraq, for example, uh, where kind of rains have failed time and again over the past decade and a half, um, the, the kind of extraordinary amounts of, of, of agricultural and municipal and residential filth that pour into the Euphrates, Euphrates and Tigris rivers means that kind of much of whatever water is left over after those diminished rains is unusable for, for anything, even agriculture, and such as the, the kind of salinity of it, that, that, that it's sort of unusable for perhaps all but date palms, such as its, its filth that, that families sort of wouldn't deign to, to, to even clean their cars with it on occasion. Um, so for as long as, as sort of air and, and water pollution continue to sort of uh, exact as, as heavy a price um, uh, as they continue to do in, in many places, um, that will just sort of add insult to injury um, as, as climate change bites. Uh, and then on a, a more sort of yeah, self, self-centered level, um, the, the crackdown on environmental defenders, um, whether they be in, in journalism like me or, or across the board, um, is, is worrying. Uh, year by year, the number who are killed goes up. Year by year, the number who are pushed into exile or uh, harassed or arrested or injured in, in, in perhaps failed attempts to, 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 to kill uh, kind of creeps up um, and, and not enough is being done about it. Um, I mean, if one, one looks at the, the, the cumulative total of, of environmental defenders killed last year uh, and compares it, compare it to the, the sort of total number of, of, of human rights defenders who, who sadly also died um, over the course of their work, it's a really inordinate share, and yet it's attracted a, a kind of tiny fraction of, of the attention that its severity warrants. Um, so if we continue like that, then um, there'll be sort of even, even fewer folks out there looking to, to sort of keep an eye on the worst environmental abuses. So all of that's got to, got to change. The scenario that you just outlined there is 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 tragic. I mean, you know, we, we, we need people like yourself to to shed a light on what's actually happening so we can do something about it. 
and you know you're certainly right that not enough is being done about it and more and more people are dying what do we need to do to change attitudes to 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 get more people interested what what can we do what can the people who are watching this do well there's the, i guess the sort of the proactive and the and the reactive responses to that the the sort of proactive is just continuing to sort of push back against the idea that the environment is just sort of birds and bees and butterflies as it was traditionally so often presented. And this is a rather a common line now, but like the environment is the is the water we drink, it's the air we breathe, it's the, the soil that grows the food that we eat. It's it's absolutely everything. Um, so I mean as a as a matter of complete urgency, we need to sort of get across the idea that that the environment is a significantly, significantly more expansive area um, than than most of us I think still still appreciate. Um, the, the perhaps slightly more depressing kind of answer to that, and unfortunately this is often a bit characteristic of, of my responses to these sorts of issues, um, is that a lot of the time I, I fear it will just take um, the, the kind of kind of crisis, the kind of dislocation that, that, that we know climate change is going to bring and that it already is bringing in many places to really hammer home the, the stakes at play here to, to many of those in positions of power. And that's a depressing answer because at the point at which a lot of these crises are staring you in the face, that's the point at which they're often too late to sort of fully address or fully mitigate, and certainly too late to, to, to address um, without lots of people um, suffering as, as, as a consequence. Um, so, I mean, there, there is, or certainly prior to the pandemic, there was kind of a whole bunch of quite encouraging stuff, like kind of things as meager as, as an article clicks on climate change or environment related articles were continuing to soar. In the last few years, uh, environment issues have kind of creeped their way from, from the back pages of, of newspapers right to the front much of the time. Um, the, 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 there is kind of positive news out there, uh, and there are positive trends. Um, we see that, that kind of young people in particular and, and others are significantly more uh, concerned about climate change than, than, than previous generations or, or even kind of themselves several years back. It's just a question of whether we can force through those changes um, at, at the necessary speed. Well, what do you think is the role of the international community now in actually taking action? I mean, at, to your point, we were seeing some movement. We were seeing, you know, for example, the, the, the Paris Climate Agreement, which for, we don't know whether the US is really going to be a part of until after the election. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's definitely been a shift, I think, in the global order, let's say, and uh, therefore it's weakened a lot of these international institutions. What, what is their role now in trying to actually bring about some positive change? To, to my mind, there are three big things that, that, that need to happen. Um, and they're, they're big, kind of at this point, seemingly unattainable things, but things that we just need to get kind of working on uh, at, at great rapidity. The first of which is that we just need to show kind of repressive states, those that are kind of cracking down on environmental journalists and environmentalists in general, that at the very least their actions will come at a cost, that they're noticed, that they're, that they're recognized. Um, there's a, a very understandable tendency to sort of mock or belittle these sort of um, proverbial statements of concern coming from the State Department or the British Foreign Office or, or the European Commission. Um, and while they're almost always insufficient, they're not nothing. Like the very idea, the very knowledge that kind of outside countries, including donor powers, are uh, seeing and watching what's happened can sometimes be, be sufficient to sort of offer a degree of, of safety to, to those on the kind of front lines of all of this. Um, the second thing is, I mean, one of the, the perhaps particularly unsavory trends over the last few years is the extent to which sort of repressive, well, extent to which sort of um, corporations, particularly those uh, engaged in, in, in those polluting industries like mining and, and uh, uh, kind of coal extraction and um, oil refining, the extent to which they've involved themselves in hounding or pursuing or sometimes killing environmental journalists or, or conservationists. Um, given that some of these companies, some of the worst offenders are themselves American or European, or at the very least have operations within North America and Europe, uh, is sufficient or should be sufficient to um, give the international community uh, a certain amount of leverage over them to, to kind of rein in that damage. And the final thing, and perhaps 
single most important thing, the thing that came up the most um, as I was kind of researching uh, this most recent uh, report that I did about, about the kind of global assault on environmental journalism, it is kind of media's, uh, addressing media's sort of notoriously tortured finances. And, and while that's something that's extremely difficult to address, um, the fact that environmental journalism is seemingly suffering from even greater financial problems than, than media at large uh, is, is a big issue. It's, it's just sometimes not seen as the most sort of sexy or eye-catching of topics. Uh, environmental investigations can be extremely expensive in a way that, that some kind of political coverage isn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, finding a way to address that is, is significantly more difficult than, than articulating the problem. Um, but yeah, environmental journalists are in many instances willing and, and able and ready to uh, take on the risks that, that come with, with reporting this, um, but they can't do it if they haven't got any money. You're, you're so right, and, and it's a very good point because it's not sexy, and that's not what you see, you know, on the front page of newspapers. Um, I, I mean, I have to say that there is a lot of depressing news out there, and it's very easy to just feel hopeless, you know, when you hear about what's going on and you hear about, you know, a lot of the things that are happening to uh, climate activists, climate journalists. A lot of these people are our friends. Um, but I will say that there's also a reason to be hopeful. I do think that, you know, our future is uh, with the next generation. And it's also very inspiring to see them be so passionate and care so much and try and change attitudes because that ultimately does lead to putting more power, uh, sorry, putting more pressure on those in power. I remember last year, for example, at the um, at the UN, I marched with a lot of young people, and it was it was so inspiring. So, just to wrap out of this, Peter, I mean, that's what keeps me hopeful. What keeps you hopeful? This is a little bit too much of a, a doom monger. It is a a, a risk um, when you talk to somebody who covers the environment across the Middle East and in parts of Africa. Um, but you're right, there, there is um, some cause for optimism. Um, perhaps the, the first bit of which is, is the thing you just mentioned, like the younger generation is significantly more interested and significantly more motivated to tackle uh, kind of climate and wider environmental woes than, than their predecessors. Very um, young people and, and if you're it, listening. Yes. Um, and while it's kind of become a little bit sort of stereotypical to, to sort of bring that up a little bit unoriginal, it, it is true. And, and if there is any kind of real force for change, it's, it's going to come from, from, from seemingly the, the under 40s for the most part. And, and the second thing is this, the, I, I am sort of uncharacteristically optimistic about the perhaps long term consequences of, of the pandemic. Um, it's felt certainly from a climate and environment perspective in the, in the last few years as if we've been kind of sleepwalking to, to our demise. Uh, yes, attention has been on the up. Yes, there's been kind of a little more action here or there, but it's been kind of the equivalent of applying a, a, a Band-Aid to a gaping wound. And so I like to think that the kind of this shock, this, this realization that, that life can change in extraordinary ways in a very brief period of time will be the, the shock or perhaps the opportunity that we need to sort of radically rework our our ways. I don't think it's going to happen in the short or medium or even relative long term. In, in that period, I think things will, will continue their rather unfortunate trajectory. But but in the long run, um, I, I can see how, how this can be the, the spark that we need. Well, Peter, I, I mean, you know, the work that you do and uh, the articles that you've written are so insightful and we really appreciate the work you do and, and we really need more people like you. Um, and I would encourage that everybody that is watching, I, I just want to thank Peter because we were supposed to have a panel of three people, um, but Peter has been our hero and I think, you know, he's you've been so interesting to speak to and it's been interesting to actually just be able to spend a bit more time with you. And I would encourage others out there to, to read some of your articles and to get in touch with him and to really find out more and to support his work. Um, so Peter, I really want to thank you for your time and for your patience. And Ariel, who is um, a Cuban biologist who was going to join us, but unfortunately couldn't, I believe that he has recorded a video message, which we will uh, be able to play out now, I believe. Okay, I'm told that we are, 
We are being joined by Evgenia now, who is from Russia for yeah, a couple yeah. of minutes. <laughs> she made it. Yeah. <laughs> Could you hear me, Melissa? I can hear you. Thank you. I'm glad that you could finally make it. I, 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 your voice is so important and we wanted to hear from you. Um, I, but I do believe that I only have two minutes with you. So I'm going to have to ask you very, I'm glad you can join us anyway, but very quickly want to just ask you, you know, how has this coronavirus pandemic affected the work that you do and what you're hearing from journalists from Russia? Uh, on my life, uh, it's really very difficult to explain <laughs> what the impact of coronavirus uh, virus on my life because it's changed all my life. Uh, for example, well, uh, I cannot uh, to speak with my friends, activists from Russia, because very often my friends from Russia to move to Estonia where I located at this moment. But unfortunately, after pandemic problem, it's was impossible and I I stay alone <laughs> and it's so difficult uh, to to observe your friends or, and uh, activists only through computer it's really difficult uh, and uh, about a situation with uh, activism on Russia at this moment really very very dangerous because unfortunately uh, Putin regime to use coronavirus uh, like uh, um, Presex for uh, new repression against activists and uh, on Russia, it's really very, very difficult to organize any campaign and uh, uh, to uh, to protect rights of activists. And at this moment, you can uh, find uh, many information uh, from Russia, uh, from independent media, uh, that it's really very difficult to organize uh, environmental campaign or other types of campaigns. Uh, and uh, uh, activists on Russia have a problem with pressure from uh, side of uh, officials and uh, we have every day we get new and new information from russia that uh, new and new activists uh, were arrested and uh, uh, it's really very very uh, sad at this moment we don't have much time so i just want to hear from you quickly you know we, we talk about digital rights and these activists going online but it's so hard in russia because putin has so much power he can just flip a switch and he senses everything. You know, he's just changed the constitution to give himself, in effect, even more power if that were possible. So how how are activists getting the word out where they are? This is exactly what I'm talking about to all the audiences. She's just been silenced. Evgenia has left us. <laughs> If we can get Evgenia back, then we will. Again, her voice and her story is very, very interesting, especially about her experience in Russia. But it just goes to show that for activists or journalists who are trying to get the word out online, it's not easy. There you are, you're back with us. I, I was just saying with Putin giving himself more power, how hard is it for activists to get the word out now online? How are they communicating? Uh at this moment in Russia, we ha we can observe a very horrible process because after pandemic, which regime to use uh, this pandemic problem uh, uh, for their interests and uh, they organize a very horrible uh, process. They change constitution. And uh, uh, of course, it's impact on uh, all Russian society. And of course, people organize a huge campaign against this violation. And uh, uh, dozens of people were arrested. And uh, at this moment, we can observe a lot of protests on regions of Russia. For example, at this moment, we have a huge, pro uh, uh, a huge protest on Khabarovsk, on far east of Russia. And uh, uh, masses of uh, uh, Putin's thugs, Putin bandits, uh, band bandits are really horrible because uh, Putin regime to use against activists all tools. 
uh, for example, uh, propaganda machine work against uh, works against activists and organize uh, fake news about activity of uh, Russian activists and uh, spread lie about activists. And of course, uh, it's uh, it's impact for ordinary life of uh, activists. And it's really very dangerous. For example, on Russia, it's really very dangerous to publish information through information on uh, internet. Uh, and we have a dozens of cases when people only publish information through true information. And after that, they have a problem and come to prison. And I think that we uh, live on a fantastic time on Russia at this moment, because it's really very, very strange why it happens. But uh, we have very big pressure from side of Putin authorities, but at the same time, we have, we have increasing number of protest group on region. I think that it's impact of coronavirus because people uh, uh, stay at home during many months and uh, keep energy. And at this moment, uh, uh, in Russia, we have a problem with economic crisis and Putin authorities try to get money from people and organize new and new uh, horrible uh, uh, projects against people. And people decide to answer that and uh, to organize protest. And you can observe protest on Bashkirtistan, for example, on Tatarstan or Far East. And if you want to find more information about uh, that you can uh, read information from our portal activatico.org every day we check information about activism in Russia and spread this information because we think it's really very important to give a voice for activists. Absolutely and that's one of the great things I was introducing you at the beginning but unfortunately you weren't there but I was saying that you are now an exile outside of Russia because you became a thorn in Putin's side when you challenged some of the projects that he was doing. And now you're giving a voice to those others inside through your website, activatica.org. Um, I want to just quickly ask you, I know we don't have much time, but you know, what is it? You've, I've had conversations with you and we've been talking about the rise of fake news in Russia as Putin tries to weaken movements like this, but it's so encouraging to see that people are going out and protesting. And if, if anything, they're protesting more, which is great. That's a silver lining to the coronavirus pandemic. But the spread of fake news, how much of an issue is fake news and specifically Facebook to what's happening with the situation in Russia? It's been both a positive and a negative. What's your experience been? Oh, it's really, really a very great question because we uh, try to check information with fake news about coronavirus. And uh, for, uh, for example, we uh, have a lot of news from Russia. Uh, I mean, new fake news from propaganda machine, uh, including uh, fake news on Facebook and other social media about very good condition of Russian medicine and Russian hospitals, but it's not true. And ordinary activists work like volunteers and uh, try to help for ordinary hospitals. And for example, a trade union uh, doctor alliance uh, try to help uh, for hospital and try uh, to attract attention of a society for this problem on hospitals, on Russian hospitals, because unfortunately Putin regime to spend money for propaganda machine, for wars, uh, for example, against Ukraine and for other disgusting needs. But uh, we don't have a normal budget for medicine needs, for education. And of course, result of that disgusting policy is a horrible situation with hospitals. And activists try to share information about that, but fake news to publish information. It's not true. It's very good condition of hospitals and we have a uh, very a good result of our uh, 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 of a uh, uh, process uh, uh, on our hospitals, but in reality, it's not true. And uh, we have a lot of cases arrested of activists who only try uh, to bring uh, masks and some equipment to hospitals. And uh, 
and some of the activists who try to share information about real situation of hospital, uh, hospitals uh, to have a problem with police now. And uh, of course, it's not only problem with fake news. We have a problem with impact uh, from side of Putin authorities to activists. But it's really fantastic news that uh, people don't stop their activity. They continue to uh, uh, to help for other peoples. They continue to uh, br uh, to bring to hospitals masks and other equipment and uh, continue this volunteers' activity. It's it's really a very inspiring trend, I think. Then people don't uh, afraid. Putin's authorities and continue their activity, and it's really very great news from Russia. That's, I mean, that's really inspiring and incredible. And Evgenia, I mean, we haven't been able to speak to you for very long, but I'm so happy that we could have you even for two minutes. I've, I've said it to you before, and I'll just say it to, our, to the audience. I mean, Evgenia has so much knowledge about Russia. I mean, Russia is a very big country, and it's it's a it's a very complicated country too, but every time I speak to her, despite the, the tremendous attacks that she herself has faced, she always leaves me feeling so hopeful because there really is something in people power and the fact that people will not be silenced and that you, know, you remember that it is our voice. So as we're very strapped for time here, I would just encourage all of you to really visit her website, activatica.org, and hear more about her. And <clears throat> I know she'd be willing to speak to all of you. But Evgenia, thank you so much for joining us. I do believe we are going to you. Uh, leave you now with a video from Ariel, who also couldn't join us today, but was another voice that we wanted. And at least for the audience watching, you will have heard a little snippet from each of them. And then you know they're all available to speak to you afterwards. So thank you, Evgenia. And here is Ariel. Thank you. My name is Ariel Ruiz Urquiolo. I am doctor in biological science, but for the Cuban regime, I am only one farmer. So um, right now I have a uh, corrupt my computer. So for that reason, I cannot participate it. In, in, in real time uh, in that kind of workshop. So then I want to speak about one of the, uh, about one of my main topics into the environmental activities. So uh, I, uh, from 1998, I started to work with sea turtle, in particular with the biological um, uh, conservation topic of that kind of marine resource as a university student. So from 2001, I started to work as a professional uh, with that kind of marine research, uh, uh, trying to look in the information about one special topic. The Cuban regime uh, was the last country that, that featured in legal way that kind of marine research. And uh, the, the goal of that kind of feature was to uh, make one international trade to Japan to sell the turtle shells. So then my goal was uh, as a research to know the genetic composition of the fishery stock. Then the idea uh, for the Cuban uh, regime was to justify that the, comp the genetic composition of the fishery stock belonged to the Hawksville that born in the Cuban beaches. But nevertheless, the, our result uh, were totally different. So the majority of the uh, uh, Foxville that the Cuban regime feature in legal way uh, born in beaches from Mexican Gulf and also in Mona Island, Puerto Rico. So then when I published together with my student all those results in one international congress from Mexico, then the Cuban regime decided to attack me for the second time and then they kicked me out from Havana University and they prohibited me to continue working with the turtle. But at the same time, at least they stopped it for full time the legal fishery of that kind of marine research in my country. Uh, although uh, that I could not continue working, uh, knowing more about the biologists and the conservation of that kind of marine research, the illegal fishery in my country continue. So I try to make several efforts to control and to know the real cause of that kind of illegal fishery. And then I knew that the majority of the fishermen settlement, they uh, did not have enough food for to eat. 
So then uh, one another problem came. So how uh, I felt at that time with how many uh, resources to manage that kind of problem, because how I could say to the uh, fishery families, you cannot fish that kind of animal because it's in the danger of extinction and you don't have enough food for to eat. So then it was a big problem for us. And on the other hand, the most interesting thing was that the fishermen, they, uh, they made that kind of illegal uh, activity, uh, not only for to, to eat for survival. The goal was to sell the meat and the turtle shell to the tourism that visited the, the country. And so then in, I, I knew that the real problem was not to, to, to eat, it was not to take meat for to eat or to take eggs for to eat, it was to obtain money for to buy shoes, for to buy dresses, for to buy another kind of food to survive, also to repay the, the houses. So then uh, the problem uh, became more deep, deep, deep until now. Why? Because I could not do so much as a researcher because first the Cuban dictatorship decided to stop my research activities. And then I became a farmer. And then on the other hand, uh, that became one real problem for the Cuban government. So the Cuban staff from the government should give another way to survival to that kind of people. But the Cuban regime always plays in double face. So they try to show one face about the conservation of the environment to the tourism and to the European countries. But on the other face, they try to uh, uh, obtain money and to preach the local people. So that was the main topic that I, that I got it. So the second topic, I don't know if I will have time for to speak. That is the problem that I got when I tried to make my bio farm in one national park from the western part of Cuba that the name is Viñales. And then I tried to make the bio farm and the Cuban dictatorship put me in jail for one year only because I tried to, to protect the natural resource in combination with the sustainable management of the animals and plants for that kind of national park. So uh, how I could not continue working as a researcher in my country, in Cuba, I decided to become a farmer because farmer is like the basis on the pyramids in the social pyramid of my country. No one want to do, uh, no one want to become a farmer is considered that the basic uh, job without any kind of uh, salary or remuneration from the Cuban uh, government. And so in the socialism system, normally the private properties uh, does not exist. So always you will depend uh, uh, of the government for to sell, for to buy, to acquire, to, for to work. But anyway, I decided to make the bio farm. And I started to, to, to make one smart plant nursery to preserve the genetic background of one special uh, uh, timber tree. So the name is mahogany. So the scientific name, Suetenia mahogany, is considered like the best wood in the world. And the main wild population uh, uh, were in my country, but nowadays you cannot find really uh, so uh, many individual, mature individual, individuals in the food because the majority of the local farmers and also the government logging for to sell the food. Then I tried to make that kind of bio farm and then I knew also that the, some uh, kind of farmer uh, started to breed wild pig uh, using the natural resource from the national park. And then when I showed to the local authority what was happening in a real way in the national park, they started to attack me using the political police again for the second time. And then uh, one day they came to my uh, farm and I was making one alive fence, so using trunk, a live trunk for to propagate it, some special of trees. And they uh, say that I did not have permission for to do that. And they put me in prison for one year. So uh, since that at that moment I have one uh, handy, uh, rustic handy, I could record the conversation uh, in between the political police and, and myself. And then, thanks to that kind of record, uh, can use for the international communities of environmental activists 
uh, to, to pressure the Cuban government for to give me the, the freedom. So the Cuban government uh, or regime never gave me that kind of condition. So they put me out to the prison after one hunger and thirst strike for more than 16 days. And uh, they put me out to the prison with one special status that was a extra penal license. So that is a little bit crazy, but extra penal license in the communist system means that you can continue in jail, but in your house. So you cannot move, you cannot do nothing without any permission. And of course, you cannot continue working as a farmer or as a real profession. Thanks for that opportunity for communicating with you and to try to explain the situation of my country and in particular my person.